I have had so many requests to cover this system, the Flextail system. I'm going to be looking at this video in some of the many, many resources for solo RPG play put out by J. Evans Payne under the imprint Infinium Game Studio. And this book alone is massive, but there are so many resources that he has created. I'm going to be covering, as I said, some of them here, not all of them. That would be many, 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 many hours of videos. But I want to give you a look inside something that's very, very different in terms of its perspective on the support needed for solo RPG play than most of the videos on my channel, yet something that I have found quite useful and which I think I will, you'll see in future videos, the approach that he takes is one of providing potentially tons of structure. And we look here at the, the credits page here that as I'll try to avoid saying too many times in the video, but is what is true is that the, the amount of material that is in really any given resource that he puts out, and this one, as we'll see, is just, it's almost overwhelming. I mean, we're going to look back here just at the like appendices that he's got listing everything in here. It's just, it is a massive amount of material. And I will leave you to discover a lot of it on your own. And I've highlighted some things from this resource and the other one that I'll show later in the video that I think give a sense of what is offered here. Why I say it's different than my approach is if you watch my videos, you know I use relatively few random tables and that I, for the most part, have the, or almost always have the kind of structure of the session just evolving. And here, and what we're going to look at here is one of the things that this book offers is a way to create a structure for a session that is more, um, how shall I say it? I don't want to say predetermined because the whole point of this system is that it is flexible and it gives you options and it does work that way. But the way in which it gives you options is, well, this is a good diagram for it. It's like a series of choices and you roll on one table and depending on that, then you go to another table and another table. So there's a lot of rolling on tables involved and a lot of getting one answer on a table and then having it take you somewhere else that branches out to somewhere else to somewhere else to somewhere else to create this kind of structure. Typically in my videos that just evolves from the as I'm narrating and, and telling the story. There's not a right or a wrong way to do it. It's just different. But I have, uh, as I said, found a lot of a lot of enjoyment in this. And I think it is useful to to show to you because I think a lot of people will will find something here that is helpful. To start out, again, I'm just going to go through some of some of the myriad of material in this book. I can't can't go. This is not a page through. This is a discussion of some things that I find particularly useful. And then you can figure that out on your own, whether or not it works for you. One of the things you'll see here at the, at the outset and within the book is he's saying that the book will work with, with Pathfinder, with fifth edition, with, well, he calls it OSR, but of course, OSR is not like one set of rules. So you need to do a little conversion there. Uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics, and um, the both editions of Pathfinder. In certain cases, this is spelled out specifically within tables, and we'll get to that somewhere in their various columns. So if you're using one system or another, you know which to look at. I can't find it here, but we'll see it later. That's very, very helpful too. Just to start out, one thing that he talks about early on is rather than doing XPs necessarily, that he has this concept of reward stars. And in the way that I play, I don't usually show multiple sessions or characters leveling up, but I just sort of decide at a certain point they are the next level, for example. Here, 
there are a bunch of tables that will allow you to convert between the XP that various systems offer. So here's the Pathfinder table, 5th edition, here's 2nd edition Pathfinder, DCC, to what he is calling reward stars or APL, which is the average, what is he, the average party level. So that you can, rather than kind of keeping track specifically of the various, the details of this, you can decide to re, um, you can decide to give reward stars as XP points for, for anything that really happens in your, in your session. You can make a decision that um, a major discovery would give a, a reward star or defeating monsters could give a reward star, overcoming obstacles, things like that. It could also be certain social interactions or perhaps discovering clues to something, a mystery that you are uncovering or whatever. And then you have these conversion here to show that depending on how many reward stars you get, what level you are. And then there's also within each table, and this is the theme of the book as you'll see, he offers different columns here if you want to advance your character slowly, if you want to do the average advancement, or if you want to do a fast advancement. And I think for people playing over multiple sessions, that is that could be very useful if you want to if you want to try to stick to the rule set that you have, but at the same time definitely be calculating or have a metric for the advancement, you could use those tables as opposed to just what I tend to do is just like, well, okay, this feels like now a second level character. We here is uh, this is a DC class generator. So depending on Again, this is going to be, follow a theme of the table uh, of the book in terms of how he organizes the material, which is there are different contexts for, and they're color coded here, for what you want your session to be. So you're going to use the context A or the first column. This is the default or ordinary level of challenge. B is going to give you additional challenge. C is going to give you less challenge, quote unquote, say easier, and D is going to be advanced level of difficulty. So depending on what you want, if you are, and here are the, the different Pathfinder 5e, Pathfinder 2nd edition, OSR rules, and DCC, you're going to take your D20, and if you want to come up with a random difficulty class, you will roll it. And then even within here, you have four different types of challenge. And these are, I can't remember, they are moderate, easy, moderate, advanced, and something. Uh, I'll put the note up here as to what they are. So for example, and you can see where this is a lot of, a lot of um, consideration. Let's just say we're doing a normal difficulty so we're going to roll our d20 here, and let's just say we're in 5e right now, and we're playing at a moderate level. We roll a 15, the difficulty class for whatever we're trying to do is going to be a 17. If we rolled a 19, it would be a 20. However, if we decided to play, say, very hard, and we rolled that 15, this would bring us to here, and it would be a 17. So this, I think this table gives both a flavor of the the very benefits of looking at the system and some of the drawbacks and the drawbacks would be that it's there's a lot going on and you might not want to get that particular as opposed to you know figuring out okay I'm rolling additional challenge but overall it's moderate so I now get a 17 as opposed to just doing the roll however it's also very useful because it does offer all these different options and you can pick and choose among them as you want. The OSR, I'll note here, this plus three, plus two, plus one, or the minus, you may need to adjust this depending on your rules. So for example, in I was going to give an example later on of Into the Odd, and uh, there you need to kind of reverse the number just based on that system. If you want something to be easier, you're going to actually subtract from your own roll 
and if you want something to be harder, you're going to add to it. So for the for the OSR, because OSR is not just a rule set, you you may need to tailor this to your specific rules that you're using. There are a number of places in the book where he talks about solo play sort of in the macro level. And here he's pointing out that the the combat is one of the easiest things to reduce to reproduce in solo play because it is you're using your standard combat mechanics and it tends to be going back and forth. He does, however, talk about what his own support materials offer for that. And one of them is what he calls the Flex AI. And we're going to look at that later in this video. Another is um, a bestiary that has what he calls um, quadded stat blocks, which will be stat blocks that will be adjustable depending on how many players and characters that you have and some other general discussion on what social encounters might be how to he calls it your own calculus for fun so the the ways in which people get enjoyment out of solo rpging and things of that nature so if you're interested in his perspective in a macro way that certainly is that's sort of scattered throughout the book it comes up a bunch of different times there is this table here that is a social interaction summary, and it is, I thought I like this one because it gives some description, like if you're trying to convince someone and you are doing 5E, you would use charisma and persuasion. These are the key to the five different rule sets or rule types that he's talking about here. If you're trying, trying to lie, for example, in... 5e, you'd be using charisma with deception. And the last thing I'll point out in this general section on solo play is he talks about how to speed something up. So if you want to speed up combat, he gives some suggestions for doing that in solo play if you find that that can drag on. The, there's a big section of the book here in the middle that is entitled Solo Quests. And this is where I'm going to give you an example of how the how one could make use of this book and how the this book allows you to plan out in certain ways the uh, structure of what your quest is going to be and it is really it is really broken down into types the there's a discussion early on here about clues and what clues mean and I think a very useful little mechanic. So he talks about clues as storytelling elements and that they can just be sort of abstract pieces of a story that come together. And there's a very useful mechanic here about how to determine whether you are advancing your story. And that what he is showing, what he's saying is that as a default, you assume that when you discover something, it's an unlinked clue. It's an unlinked clue is a piece of information that may prove useful in the future. So when you discover that, and you can decide what that is, you log it into your character sheet. And by the way, it says here the quest tracker in the appendix provides space for that. I didn't actually see the quest tracker there, so just as a note, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what that is, so. Uh, whenever you receive a new quest, you are going to have a clue target. So let's just say you need to find five linked clues. If you discover a clue and you have one unlinked clue, that the chance that it's actually a related clue is only 10%. So you roll your D100 to determine whether or not that one clue you have is indeed linked or not. And let's just say it's not because 90% chance it's not. You continue on, you find another clue. When you have two unlinked clues, you're rolling on this table and you have a 15% chance that one of them is gonna be related and so on. Let's say it takes you four clues and eventually you roll that one of them is actually linked. What you then do is you, you transfer that over, you mark that to being a linked clue and you continue on. It says if you determine that one of your unlinked clues does apply, you then reference this table here to determine how many of them actually apply. So 
you have one unlinked clue that's relevant. You roll on this table. This is so confusing. <clears throat> but instead of just saying that it is actually linked, then there's yet another table that you roll on again. So if you have one online clue, it's it's applicable to the new quest. But once you get to up to four to five online clues, you can roll to see how many of the new ones are applicable. Now, you might just choose to disregard this table altogether and just simply stick with this and count off how many clues you get. That's probably what I would do, but it you, you could you could go on to to use this table in this way, depending on how many clues you had. Well, this will probably make more sense when I show you a little bit more of the structure of how he's setting up sessions. There's a table here of clue finding by environment, and this is, again, if you want to go to a table to decide what the chances are of finding a clue, you can use this table. Now, I had a little bit of a ripe with this table because if you're in, for example, a dungeon here, basically it's only telling you that you're going to find a clue if you roll a 20 or a 19 to 20. And the, so that by default, basically any dungeon has no clues. And, and I would sort of, I would differ with that and say that if you are setting up a session that wherever you are, whatever location you are, you could deem either irrelevant or perhaps an unrelated building, because it is. Um, it would seem to me if you're in that place, unless it's like a, you're trying to explore overall, that um, it would be relevant. And again, here you're mostly just getting yeses. So this, uh, again, to me, it's a little bit much. But I'm pointing it out because some people may be, maybe, wanting this type of guidance. I guess is the word. Now, I do want to spend some time on this section, this plot-based solo adventuring, because I'm going to, I walked through it with a character, a couple characters I made. I chose Into the Odd for this for a number of reasons. One, because um, Into the Odd is, is such a light rule set. I want to show you how such a big, how such a big structure of support can actually work with such a light rule set. And two, because it's very easy to make characters, and I made two characters for this little demonstration and they wa they are Vanessa Tumble. Vanessa Tumble is a lesser noble. She's really wedded to her career and she is traveling with Calhead Bar Bargroll, who's a jewel a jeweler. And he's expensive and flashy and they their little story is they're traveling through a wine cellar network. Um, because there's some debt collectors who are applying pressure to them. And I haven't developed the story yet about what they're, why they're in this wine cellar. I think what it's going to be, well, actually, that's not true. I did develop the story a little bit because I worked it out. I wanted to show you how this works. Um, they are trying to, in this wine cellar network, they're trying to find and retrieve a very valuable bottle of wine that they're going to give to their debt collectors. That's that's what I've got. And I worked out their stats and what they're carrying. I'm not going to play out the story right here, but maybe I will. I'm already interested in these characters, so maybe I will eventually. But I want to show you, I did this so I could show you how after you create something very basic here, how you could flesh out a story using this plot-based soul adventuring materials. Here. Now, I said that I turned to I, this once I had determined that my characters were going to be traveling through a wine cellar network because debt collectors were applying pressure and they needed to get something and, and retrieve it. However, you don't need to approach the flex tail with that already in mind. And in fact, I think a lot of users of this supporting system will find something here 
that is to their liking, which is a random table to give you a plot structure. So say you're starting with nothing. You could roll on this table and decide that you are going to be having the plot structure of a delivery of something or getting something or an abstract mystery. We're going to look at that one a bit later or exploration or chase, whatever. In my case, since I already had some concept in mind, I feel that um, that is going to be the obtain plot structure so that they would need to be finding this item and I'm making that determination. But again, it is, it is all here for you to, to do randomly if that's the way you wanted to do it. But following my story, so I determined that the overall structure is going to be that we are obtaining something and that furthermore, it is going to be that we're going to have to get it and bring it somewhere. So moving forward a little bit in the book, it is the type of quest. So you have the type of quest that you would within the subcategory of obtaining. To me, that's this is something that we have to fetch. It is a fetch, fetching quest to get something. And furthermore, getting a little deeper into it, I have decided that this thing that we're going to get is going to be guarded by somebody. Now, again, you could be doing random roles to come up with this type of structure. I am choosing the scenario, but the point is you could just be developing this completely randomly. Then the next thing that I want to, to do here is to figure out how, men, how will I know I'm progressing in my quest? And this is where the concept of clues comes into play. And there's discussion in the book a little bit here and also elsewhere about clues being abstract story markers or concepts that show you you're moving the story forward, either if it's a relevant clue or you're distracted and not moving the story forward if it's irrelevant. And this is for those of you that have played For Against Darkness, for example, you know that there is a, also this abstract concept of clues. And when you collect enough clues, you can get a secret that then, I think that's the lingo in that game, that then moves your story forward. What's really interesting here is that there are tables to create either reward or penalty categories for the progress that you're doing in your story. And here I did roll randomly to determine, and this is what I came up with. I came up with the concept that I'm going to need four clues in order to know that I've gotten to the place that this cask is, for example, that I have successfully obtained it. And the reward for the clues if I successfully get one is going to be one of four things or the penalty or one of two things. I rolled these things up randomly and let me just show you as an example what this means. So for example, I find a clue, I get something, I achieve something along the way. Maybe I, that clue is going to be something on the body of an enemy I've dispatched with. If I wanted to keep it totally random, I could roll a d4 and come up with one of the predetermined types of rewards I get. And we'll just take a look at what these are. So this is later in the book. There's a whole section on rewards and penalties. And um, let me just mark this page. Here. For example, the first type of reward, if I rolled a one, it would be a mechanical reward. And then you get to the section on mechanical rewards. And you can see, again, you could be rolling randomly or you could just decide yourself that the reward is going to be some type of a rules adjustment or some type of a skill benefit. You could also roll randomly or decide, is it going to happen right now? Is it going to happen the next encounter? Or is it going to happen for multiple sessions moving forward? Then you might want to know, well, exactly what is, let's say it's a rules adjustment, the reward. What is the rules adjustment? Again, these are tables within tables. You could choose to be rolling randomly on them, 
or you could decide yourself what makes sense. So let's just say that I looted a body and I decided that um, the mechanical benefit I was going to get from looting that body that was going to happen right now is a rules adjustment. I roll a d20 and we rolled up a 10. So the, the, I get this vicious blows adjustment and it's referring me to page 348. So let's see what this is. I don't know what that is. What is this rules adjustment? Well, it says you are incredibly effective at harnessing your muscles and Sino into melee strike. So if you choose this option, double count your strength bonus to your melee attack damage. So basically, and then there's a specific kind of pathfinder thing. So you would have to modify that a little bit. And it also doesn't say here, or is this going to be permanent? We haven't decided this session. Is it going to be just the turn? That's not really an option here. But let's say I would decide that I looted this body and the clue that I found, maybe it was a potion or something that the enemy had that I could then drink, again, making it thematic into the story, such that for the next encounter, I was going to have a benefit on my strength. So that would be an example of a mechanical rules adjustment benefit that I could get from discovering a relevant clue. Let's just take a look at, for example, the magical benefits on page 420. So there's magical rewards and that it's not just magical items, but it's magical things that could happen. So let's let's just go random here and see what um, we rolled an eight. So service and what does service mean in this context? A magical service reward. It says spellcasting services are typically available in most large fantasy towns for a fee. This category pertains to more specific and general benefit that could apply to any adventuring party. Roll to determine. So we rolled a one, overland travel. This benefit is that magical enhancements cause your entire party to travel more swiftly in between points of interest on the world map. So you can see in this particular case, if I'm doing a narrow session that doesn't involve overland travel, that wouldn't necessarily help me, but you could modify that to be thematic to what you were doing. Perhaps it would let you travel through an area of your, if it's a dungeon, you know, more easily or whatever, or disregard an obstacle that came your way or something like that. Or if you were doing a larger type of session or campaign where you did have travel, you would just note this down for a future benefit. And of course, there aren't only benefits, there's penalties too. So there's uh, social penalties. Let's look here. And the social penalties are listed here again, obviously in a chart. So if we got an 11, that would be attitudes. And then we would turn to the section here and see what this is. Again, another chart. This is a when receiving an attitude penalty, you roll on this table to determine it and see it's basically, it applies to say an NPC or a faction, 12 set to hostile. And what that means is basically that, you know, your next encounter with somebody is going to be hostile, regardless of perhaps what you rolled or what it seemed like it was going to be. So that could be a penalty. And all of this was generated out of expanding on what the clues that you found would actually mean. And this is, I think, an example uh, in the middle of this book of the what he's calling handicaps and rules adjustments. And there are just many, many of them here. And now I did say I wanted to go back and just show you at the outset of the plot templates because one of one of the things I think that is quite challenging for perhaps obvious reasons for solo play is to try to do something that in and of itself is structured as a mystery. So if you're doing an abstract mystery here, say you're rolling up an abstract mystery, you can use the plot template here. And I just want to show you what is, what is offered. So here's the section on abstract mysteries. And again, you can see at the outset, the largest, the, the most general category is the mystery quest type. So we will just say, well, we rolled, okay, rolled a 20. So, all right, a nine, it's a cover up. Okay. So we know that the 
overall structure is a cover-up, something has taken place, and the benefactor seeks to make sure as few people find out about the event as feasible. The PCs, that is you, are being asked to take action because they are sufficiently far enough removed from the benefactor and those involved that it would arouse less suspicion than if official channels were used. Each time the PCs let slip the news of what took place, there is a cumulative 5% chance that the quest has failed immediately. So there's something built in here to show you, to put a little bit of, say, pressure on you as the player that you are perhaps failing your quest. So then the next thing you could do is roll here to find out, well, who is this benefactor? And this is how you start to create your story. So we rolled a 13. It's an ordinary person. Okay. They, let's see, though they may still be of decent means to reward your efforts. They're not particularly notable or in any other, in any other way. And as such, it says, rather than re-rolling on, rolling on the reward category table for this request, you can get a social reward. So it's giving you some further suggestions. And it says, uh, even the most open-ended of mysteries relies on a suspicion. So what do we know? Well, what we know has to do with, oh, it has to do with some type of an affair. Someone has lightly committed adultery. Now, we are putting this in the context of a cover-up. So you can see where you would then be able to flesh out a story that has to do with who's covering up what type of affair or whatever. It is an ordinary person. And let's see. And, and then at the conclusion of your efforts, you will come to a determination as to whether the suspicion was borne out or not. And here it says it's a misunderstanding in the end. So... For example, this wasn't an affair after all, whatever. Um, so no, you get no other mechanical effects in play. So you can see that's the overall structure of it. And then within this, you can go into further details about mystery suspects involvement and whether there's multiple suspects or a web of intrigue and so on. This is where you would determine how many clues are needed to solve this mystery. We already talked about that. Once you have those clues, you can predetermine what a success or failure of those might be. And we get into the reward categories of those clues and penalties and things of that nature. And what the stakes are here, that uh, what the outcome would mean. And this is a sample outline of a very simple plot structure for the a single person of interest mystery. So that is a, a look inside, a relatively brief look inside a, an incredibly rich resource for solo RPG. And now we're going to take a look even within this, there's a, a brief section on AI behavior, but of course there's a whole book about AI behavior. And now we're going to look at that. In a sense, it's easier to demonstrate the Flex AI guidebook because it is more consolidated. And by that, I don't necessarily mean shorter because this is another very massive book, but it is more focused, I guess, is the, what, the word I'm looking for. It is self-described as tools for intelligent dynamic creature combat. And by creature here, we have a combination of NPCs as well as enemies. And in this case, the table of contents is pretty straightforward in the sense that the book is divided into combat encounters with enemies and then social encounters with essentially NPCs. And then within that, you have various categories of what you are encountering. So if your enemy is in the category of brute that you could decide, then you have the tables there. If it's artillery or a skirmisher or a soldier, you would go to the various tables. And we'll get into showing you that, but I want to open up actually by demonstrating how the social encounter situation might work out of this book. And for that, I'm going to refer back to a situation from my Cairn video. It isn't necessary that you have watched the Cairn video, although I will put a link to the Cairn video up here as well as down below if you want to get the full story. But at the outset of that video, I created a situation based on something that I rolled up in my Wanderings book. 
And in that, I had two PCs and an NPC. And the NPC was like a ghost, basically. I wasn't sure of the relationship of the PCs to the NPC, but it was going to form an important part of the story. And indeed, it did form an important part of the story. So I wasn't using this social encounter matrix here for that, but I want to show how it would have worked if I, if I had used it. And again, you don't need to know what that was. You just need to know that what I'm trying to figure out here is I've got two PCs and an NPC. The NPC is a ghost or a specter of some sort, and they're going to have an interaction. So the optional social roles here and the tables are geared toward if somebody is an ally, an asset, an acquaintance, an opponent, or a bystander. Now, in this case, I don't actually see, as there is often in this system, a way of just randomizing this. These are just five different options. Because in the case that I'm referring to, I wasn't sure what the the NPC that I encountered even was to assign them a category here. And I think as a soloist, that may often be the case. So you might want to just roll randomly here to determine if you encounter somebody. Again, there's five choices here, but I suppose you could re-roll on a six or, you know, choose on your own. I got a one here. So just to go with that, we would follow the ally set of tables and they give you an example of what allies might be, but in the case of your story, you might know. So in the case of that story, the ghost is coming to help us. So we would turn to the ally tables here, and then working as the tables do with the rest of the system, we would have a choice of, were we rolling on the passing by table? Is this a normal ally we're passing by? Do we think it's going to be combat? Was it in a lull or a long rest? And again, this would make sense if you were already having your story. If you didn't, you could randomize this to just sort of see. But I imagine you would know whether you were at a formal gathering or a short rest, for example, when you encountered somebody. In the case of what I'm the example here, I'm going to say that the ally was an actually what is an important person. So it was an elite ally and it was passing by. We were passing by in the story. In essence, it was really the opening of the story. But so working here, we have, we can see that there's a couple of different, this looks a little bit different than we've seen before. In this instance, you can do some random roles to see what your outcome might be. And then there is a DC table here. And the first number is representing sort of more D&D &D numbers. And the second one would be more Pathfinder numbers. And then you would also be rolling, as we discussed earlier, on what level of encounter you wanted to have. So we're going to say we're at a moderate encounter here. And if I did a random roll and we're using just the default column A, we could see, we'll just see what we would get here. So what, um, just with the interaction, what would it be? Well, we, roll, we rolled a 98. So that is telling us that we have the object, uh, the, the outcome to get information from this subject. And what is the DC level for doing that would be if we're doing fifth edition, it would be a DC of 11. And then, of course, we would need to use our relevant skill for that. And I don't have a character here for that, but we rolled a two. So let's just say that was a fail, whatever our, you know, whatever our modifier was, we failed. So then you go to the failure table and you roll a D100 on the failure table to see what that failure and count what that failure entailed. So that's a 35. So we rolled a 35. Again, we're on column A here. So the failure in this case means they just ignore us. So if I was going through this scenario and wanted to work with all these tables at this level of detail, what it would mean would be I would do all that rolling and my PCs would basically be passing by this specter. They would totally ignore us and that's it. Another way to, to work with this material is to be more active about what you want the outcome to be, which I think is a more natural way because you're seeking some interaction with a P, an NPC and wanting to determine 
the outcome. So let's say I am I want to gather information from this specter. I go to whatever category of encounter I'm working here. Say we're still with moderate, and I roll on. I use my stat and my modifier. We've got a DC of nine. I rolled a nine, so let's say I had a plus one or whatever. Even if I had nothing, that would be a success. So then I would go down to the ally passing by a success table and give a random D100 roll to see at 35, I think that was what I rolled before, 35, what a success meant. Well, it meant that we would actually get help. So that's a pretty obvious answer, but it's broken down into, it's, it's pretty variegated here into what the options are. So they could give us a willing answer. Maybe that would be something that would be um, have a po more positive outcome. They could volunteer information. So then you could go and try to do more of an exploration for yourself about gaining some extra piece of information or a plot clue. Maybe they challenge you. They could, as, as stated, ignore you, leave. They could turn hostile, perhaps into a combat scenario. So you get from here a variety of things to possibly do with a DC for doing it, and then the success or failure tables. The one thing I noticed when I was working with this prior to the video is that in the failure table, you could still get help. So I'm not sure how you would work with that if your initial was a fail, but then you got help. So you'd have to, you'd have to sort of figure that out in the context of your story, I guess. I'm not sure what the decision-making was by putting help into the failure table, but it is there never, nevertheless. Whereas in the success, we still have turn hostile. I think that's a little easier to narrate. Uh, perhaps you push too far or whatever. Um, but in any event, you could get a red herring or lies. And then of course, it is up to you to figure out how you would carry that forward in the rest of your story. Earlier on in the book, it does the author does provide you with a little bit of information about what these things might mean. So for example, the uh, a willing answer is gets a good deal of detail. NPC will answer the questions to the best of their ability. You could interpret that if you're playing solo, that you could maybe roll on more tables if you have a lot of random tables describing a scenario or an environment or whatever you're looking for that say you're work, say you're out doing an outside thing, you could roll for exploration extra times with a willing answer to give yourself more places to go. Or if you get a challenge here, it says this is not a mortal combat level of dueling challenge, but rather a social challenge. To proceed further with this NPC, the party must make a successful social check. And it says use one of the choices available depending on the task. I think that's a typo. The party wishes to take. Failure means the NPC leaves immediately. Critical failure or at the GM's discretion means this may turn hostile. And then you could see turning hostile, this could either trigger a combat or perhaps the PCs have like one final chance to defuse the situation. You could roll again, perhaps with a dire consequence if you fail. So the social encounter results are explained as well. Moving back to the front of the book, you have, in essence, a very similar thing, but for combat scenarios with both, it could be either PCs or it could be, excuse me, NPCs or actual um, enemies, monsters and such. And the outcomes are described here that um, there's a main attack, a secondary attack, if the creature has that, or they might maneuver you, they might use an item or their ability, or they may try to flee. And it's stated here as it is in many places in these materials that of course you can use this to the level of detail that you want. There's also a whole section on combat targeting. So if you had multiple PCs and you wanted to really play out the combat in a kind of tactical way, you could roll on these tables too to determine who is targeted and what happens with that. So as the combat goes, even round to round, you could change the target or whatever. The 
there are combat roles described here, and the rest of the combat tables are broken down into these general categories. So when you encounter an enemy, you need to assign them one of these roles, determine what it is. And each section explains what it is and then gives examples, classes, and how to assign it. So this is actually very important to using this book and um, pretty, pretty well done. So we're going to focus in a little bit here on this. So for example, a brute is going to inflict high damage, typically via a melee attack. It has a great deal of hit points, but possibly low defense. It gives some examples like an ape, a bear, cyclops, most dinosaurs, most elementals, and most giants. For classes of, of NPCs, barbarian and some fighters. And then it says how to assign any creature who lacks a great deal of special abilities, whose default melee strikes inflict a great deal of damage. So you could, reading this, get a sense of what a brute might be. And um, let's look at one more here that's going to be different, this artillery. So ranged attacks are the main focus of artillery, typically have very low hit points and or defenses, however. Examples, tritons, pale stranger, some gremlins, rangers, and many elves. Classes, rangers, some fighters, and rogues. How to assign any creature whose primary attack or abilities are ranged. And so it's broken down further here, but it will give you, it will give you pretty clear direction in assigning to the what you are encountering. And then and then the tables that we're going to look at in a minute go into the different combat stances of the enemy. So for example, if it is uh, if it's designated fresh, this means that in most combats creatures begin the encounter in this stance, well rested at full hit points, ready to do battle. So like if you're just encountering something or perhaps you may determine either within rounds if you're switching tables or at the outset you come across a bloody dragon, you know, in the forest or something, and you are going to attack that. Cornered, if it's overwhelmed, if it's relentless or mindless. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, of course, in changing tables round to round. So if you're starting out with this normal brute who is fresh, and then as the fighting goes, it becomes bloody. You could then move to, for example, this table for bloodied. Or if you determine, if you're doing targeting and you determine ultimately, if you're using minis in particular, that they become cornered or they're overwhelmed. If they were a bunch of, if they were a bunch of uh, enemies and then they're down to two and they're overwhelmed, you could go to this table. And we're not going to go through and do all the rolling, but you can see it's the same kind of scenario as we've seen where you're rolling on the context that you've previously chosen, whether it's the, the default one or whether you're outmatched or the creature is outmatched, or it's just a reduced challenge in general, and then you can roll and get your results. And again, you could switch tables from round to round. You could just stick with the same table over and over again. But the point is that if you are willing to continue to switch tables, you are going to come out with a combat situation where the enemy is changing and the enemy behavior and possibilities for the enemy are changing because that is the, the key, the uh, signature of these flex tail of these flex tail systems. And just to look at the back here for a moment as we can cl conclude looking through this, it does, uh, it's an attempt to model and simulate uh, monster and NPC behavior. It scales in complexity and it is, does contain hundreds of detailed scenarios to, to generate this. So we've got over 860 tables, tens of thousands of combinations and permutations, and does takes a role of the D100 to have that enacted. And again, with this particular book, it is, I think, a little more manageable in a way because it's just focusing on one thing. And the the fact, I think for the for me personally, in terms of the kinds of play that I do, and if you're a if you're a sort of longtime viewer of the channel, this isn't going to come to any surprises you for you. The the social aspect of this, I think, is probably what I would use the most because I tend to want more detail and variety 
in social interactions. And I also think that's where, because you don't have the guidance of, say, a rule that's telling you, I just, I, you know, I thrust my sword into someone and I did all this damage. I think there's a lot of already built in mechanical direction there. And by that, I mean, direction from the rules that you're reducing, you know, your enemy is reduced by half its hit points. You can sort of envision that it might be weaker or whatever. Now, you might want tables to direct you and you might want the possibility of a guided response in that if you roll the dice, that you're going to get a more likely chance that it will be a weaker hit from a weaker enemy. But I think that's also pretty, for me at least, that's pretty easier to imagine. Whereas here, coming across, you know, rolling up a random NPC, just sort of wandering out in the castle or whatever, or the in the hills or something, there I think it could be anything. It could be anything. And when it could, when something could be anything, as we know, it also could easily be nothing. And you can get into a situation if you roll on a yes, no kind of yes, no, maybe table, perhaps you just get into that situation where you're continuing to roll and nothing's actually happening. Here, you, because there are, it's more guided tables, you can have the possibility of generating something that is will move along narratively in the way that you want. So deciding, either deciding or rolling at the outset that this person is, maybe it's a bystander, whatever, but you're, you're still given these social choices and the social contexts that are very conducive to helping narrative move along. And for this reason, I think the Flex AI guidebook is particularly useful.